How about the rest of you? Do you have any question related to the metabolism? For the metabolism chapter, we don't, you don't have any diagrams, no diagrams from the metabolism that would be on your uh, lab exam or on your final exam, on the, on the optional final exam. You won't have metabolism, the metabolism chapter on it. All right, so metabolism chapter is gonna be tested only in the quiz, in the chapter quiz and in the lecture exam four. So you're gonna see only questions related to the metabolism uh, on either the, uh, on both the chapter quiz and on the lecture exam, but you don't have any lab related questions on either the lab exam or the final exam. Again, the final exam is option substitutes the lowest lab exam grade. And it's gonna be proctored like any lab exam. What you're gonna be studying for the final exam is the same thing that you studied for all the four lab exams. All right, so let us review a, an important topic in the metabolism, so I will put it in the form of questions that you're gonna be completing for as an in-class activity for today's session. So what are the three steps of the glucose Catabolism. To produce ATP. So seeing the breakdown of the glucose to produce energy. And those were three main steps. One is taking place in the cytoplasm and two are taking place in the mitochondria. What were those three steps? What do you think? When I break down the glucose to get energy in the presence of oxygen. Exactly, Nina. So first step was the glycolysis. Glycolysis. I break down the glucose. I split it into two pyruvate get pyruvic acid and this pyruvate gonna be passing through a cascade of chemical reactions that we've called the Krebs cycle and from the Krebs cycle I would be getting the hydrogen 
from this glucose attached to the hydrogen carrier and ADH, FADH, those will need to be transported in another cascade of chemical reactions that will allow me to release the high energy output. This is going to be through the electron transport chain and the oxidative phosphorylation. Electron transport chain and the oxidative phosphorylation was the third step that takes place on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Do you remember how many ATPs are going to be produced? per one glucose yeah 32 to 36 ATPs why is it a range do you remember why is it a range not just one single number because some of the energy is going to be lost in the form of heat in the electron transport chain. Some of the energy is being lost as heat. That's why we put it as a range. Sometimes it's going to be 32, sometimes it's going to be slightly more than 32, up to 36 ATPs. So what is the hormone? What are the two hormones? It is uh, first here. in a catabolic state and what is the hormones it's going to be released during an anabolic state if i did if i didn't eat i have no energy my body will start to create a series of catabolic reactions. What hormone is gonna be released that will allow the catabolism, allowing you to break down your stores? Exactly. Cortisol and glucagon. And what hormone would be released during the anabolic state? If I did just eat, 
I have high blood sugar level. I want to store this glucose. You want to build up my muscles, build up the protein. Yeah, this is going to be my insulin. Insulin is the main hormone that gets released during the anabolic state. What do we call the basic amount of energy needed to carry on the basic body needs. Like to allow your heart to contract, your muscle tone, your respiration. What do you call this basic amount of energy that we're going to be consuming just for us to be able to maintain life? What do you think? What do you call this basic amount of energy ATP in the currency like the dollar so for example if I'm telling you the basic amount of income that will allow me just to survive is let's say 2000 bucks a month the ATP is just the dollar but the amount i need just to survive for me to be able to pay my bills to get food is two thousand bucks a month yeah so what is this amount it's gonna be the basal metabolic rate basal metabolic rate exactly This is my basal metabolic rate. Good morning, Alexis. This is going to be my again basal metabolic rate. This is a basic amount of energy that you are going to be in need of just to carry on the very basic tasks to maintain life. So If we're looking here at the Krebs cycle and the glycolysis. So please complete the following diagram on here.
So you've got here something from the inside of the inner membrane of the mitochondria that will bind to the substance that you've got from number eight, which is number nine, inside of the inner membrane of your mitochondria. And then those two, when attached to one another, they will form another substance. And this passes in a cascade of chemical reactions, producing NAD, H, FADH, multiple ones. So two, eight, carbon dioxide, and So can you complete this diagram here for me, please? So from the glycolysis, you split the glucose into what? Break down the glucose into what? That's number eight. Two pyruvate, two pyruvic acids. Exactly. And then you transport this pyruvate to the inside of the inner membrane of the mitochondria, but in the way you're going to be transforming it into what? For it to be able to get into the Krebs cycle, this is a three carbon molecule. You're gonna lose carbon dioxide and you're gonna transform it into a two carbon, two carbon molecule. What do we call this two carbon molecules that enters in the Krebs cycle? This is my Krebs cycle on here. What do you think? Exactly, acetyl coin. Acetyl coins are made. You remember. In order for you to break down those two carbon molecules, the acetyl-CoA, you need to bind the acetyl-CoA to what? Oxalo. acetate or oxaloacetic acid from the inside of the mitochondria, exactly. And when you bind the oxaloacetic acid or oxaloacetate to the acetyl-CoA, what you get? The very first step, yeah, citrate or citric acid. Or citrate. Remember, that's why we we give the Krebs cycle another name, which is actually more famous now, is the citric acid cycle. Citric acid cycle is the Krebs cycle. Questions, questions.
No, you just can list the answers. So you put number seven, basal metabolic rate, number eight, two pyruvic acid, nine, acetyl CoA, 10, oxal acetic acid, 11, citric acid. So just list the answers in the in class activity doc. All right. Questions, questions. So this is a relatively small chapter. This is a relatively small chapter. So please, please, please make sure you study very well the reproduction. We have many diagrams in the reproductive system. We have a lot of important material in the reproductive chap in the reproductive system chapter. The next chapter that is coming on. We have the lo a very long essay question. Very long essay question. So please take the time to watch the video recordings. Study this chapter very well before our next meeting because our next meeting is going to be so intense covering the reproductive system all right so it's very very important very important to spend good amount of time to watch the video recordings. Covering the reproductive system. All right. So here is also number one, two, four. Any question? Any question? So I want to first, before we leave, to just point out the important diagrams in the reproductive system that you're going to have all of them. All of them going to be on your test. And reproductive system on the lab exam is greatly represented. Like you're going to have at least 50 points for the reproduction or even 60 points out of 100 points covering is just the reproduction. All right, so the very first diagram is a 10 stars diagram on here. 10 stars diagram showing the sagittal section of the pelvis of a male pelvis and it shows the reproductive the male reproductive system it's a 10 stars diagram it must be on your test it must be on your test so what can we see on here the gonads the testes the epididymis the vas difference that will carry the sperms up towards the pelvis. And we have this bulging part of the vas deferens that will receive secretions from the seminal vesicle, which is just a gland. So the sperms here are gonna travel. Seminal vesicle gonna release its secretions. The duct of the seminal vesicle along with the vast difference will fuse together and will form what we call the ejaculatory duct. Right and left ejaculatory ducts gonna be releasing the semen into the part of the urethra traveling through the prostate gland located at the base of the urinary lab.
the part of the urethra that travels through the prostate gland. This is what we call the prostatic urethra. Prostatic urethra. Then the urethra travels to the outside of the prostate gland. We call this part of the urethra. If you remember back from the urinary system, this is the intermediate urethra or membranous urethra. Then the urethra travels in the penis. We call the part of the urethra traveling in the penis. This is the penile urethra or spongy urethra. Again, this is a part of the urethra traveling in the penis. The penis itself is divided into three segments. Root, shaft or body, and glands. The external opening of the urethra. This is going to be the external urethral orifice. Opening is the orifice. Outside, external of the urethra, it's urethra. So we're going to call it the external urethral orifice. At the entrance of the membranous urethra in the penis, it receives the secretions from a small, tiny little gland. At the junction here between the urethra and the penis, we call this is the bulbo-urethral gland or Cooper's gland. So bulbo-urethral gland, it's not going to be releasing secretions that get mixed with the sperms to form the semen, like the seminal vesicle and the prostate gland. Those are sharing in the formation of the semen that gets ejaculated. The Cooper's gland is the one that will be producing this clear mucus secretion that precedes the ejaculation. Its secretion is not part of the ejaculation here, Cooper's gland or bulbo-urethral gland. The secretion precedes the ejaculation and it's going to be neutralizing the urine, any remaining urine droplets in the urethra gets the urine neutralized. And it's going to be lubricating the glands of the penis to facilitate the intercourse. We can see the testis is kept outside of the pelvic cavity for us to maintain a lower than the body temperature to be able to produce the sperms. Normal production of the sperms can be taken place at the normal body temperature. It's too hot inside the body cavity. So the cremasteric muscle here is gonna be playing a role in regulating the temperature to which the testis is exposed to to create a suitable environment for the sperm production. So if it's too cold, what's gonna happen? The muscles gonna be pulling the testis up towards the body cavity for it to be warmer. If it's too hot, the muscle will relax, will make the testis pending down away from the cavity. Again, for me to create <coughs> Excuse me. To create a suitable environment for normal sperm production. Thank you. All right. 
another highly important diagram that we we'll have in the reproductive system. It's the sagittal section, the 10 stars diagram showing the sagittal section of the testes. So we can see the coverings of the testes. So we've seen here the outermost covering of the testes. It's the skin pouch, scrotum. We do have two membranes covering the testes, one that is firmly adhering to the outside of the testes. This is called the tunica albuginea, alba, alba white. So the white covering that firmly attaches the external body of the testes, this is the tunica albuginea. To the outside of the tunica albuginea, you're going to have a membrane formed of two layers. This membrane formed of two layers, it's the tunica vaginalis. And in between the two layers, you have a very tiny little cavity. We call it the cavity of the tunica vaginalis. The sperm production is going to be taking place through those convoluted tubules. We call the convoluted tubules on here. This is my semi nephrous tubules. Those are my semi nephrous tubules. And those semi nephrous tubules are arranged into lobules. So the, the seminiferous tubules are arranged into lobules that are separated by septi. Those lines that will be separating the lobules or the seminiferous tubules, it's the septa. From the seminiferous tubules, the spurs are going to be transported to a network of ducts to exit the testes. We call this network of ducts. It's my reti testes. From the reti testes, the sperm is gonna be traveling through another set of tubules located above the testes in an organ that we call the epididymis. All this is my epididymis. We divide the epididymis into three parts. The head of the epididymis, body, and the tail of the epididymis. Head, body, and tail. The tail of the epididymis is continuous with a duct that will carry the sperms up towards the pelvic cavity. We call this is again my vast difference or ductus difference. Vast difference or ductus difference. The, the vast difference, you see on here, we did draw it. It's, it's traveling up to the pelvic cavity. It doesn't travel by itself like it's shown on this diagram. It actually travels through a larger structure, which is the spermatic cord. And inside the spermatic cord, you've got the vast difference carrying the sperms. You've got the nerve fibers for the innervation. You've got the blood vessels, either arteries carrying the oxygenated blood to the testes or the pampini form of plexus of veins that will drain the deoxygenated blood away from the testes back to the heart. So again, again, what we're looking here at, it's a 10 stars diagram. Must be on your test. Must be on your test. Again, you have seen tunica albuginea on the inside, tunica vaginalis on the outside, which is formed of two layers. Where the sperm production is taking place is inside the seminiferous tubules, which are arranged into lobules and separated by septi. 
the seminiferous tubules will conduct the formed sperms into a network of ducts. We call this as the reti testis. And from the reti testis, we're going to be carrying the sperms to the epididymis. Again, we divide the epididymis into head, body, and tail. The continuation of the tail of the epididymis will carry the sperms up towards the pelvis. We call it the, we call it the vas difference or the ductus difference. So you're going to need to memorize all of them, all of them. You need to know every single marking on those diagrams. And you need to understand what is pointed to, all right? You need to understand for you to, if you are, if you have a change in the label position, you will be able to figure out what is meant by the label. So you need to have a good understanding of what those words mean, what they are pointing to actually. All right, so because you might think here, yeah, this is the testis. So if I put it like this, I can put the circle like this and I point it out like this. So it is still the testis, all right? So memorization of the diagram doesn't mean you know only the those specific positions of the labels, but you are able to understand what is pointed out by those labels all right this is very important very important because this is something i've i've seen in uh, the previous exam so people got confused with a very minor changes in the diagrams very minor change so this means that they do just memorize how the diagram looks like and they answer accordingly, they don't have a real understanding of what is pointed to on the diagram. Does what I'm saying make sense? Is there anybody who's still listening? All right, so we can have a break for five. I need to turn off the sprinklers here. It gives me headache. All right, so we can have a break for five. We come back, discuss the remaining diagrams uh, uh, of the reproductive system. All right, so we'll see you in five. Thank you.
All right, welcome back. So just double check if you can still hear me and if you can still see the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. All right, great. So another highly important diagram is another 10 stars diagram is shown an interior view, uh, an interior view of the uh, transverse section of the penis. So it's the superior uh, section on here that we're looking at or the dorsal section. So the penis when cut in a transverse pattern This is how it looks like from inside. It's gonna have three erectile tubes. Two erectile tubes that are located on the superior side, on the dorsal side of the penis. Those two are the corpora cavernosa. Corpora cavernosa, the single noun is a corpus cavernosum. And located below the corpora cavernosa, we've got this erectile tube that surrounds the urethra. We call this is the spongy urethra. This part of the urethra is a spongy urethra. And the surrounding erectile tube, it's the corpus spongiosum. And why do we use sponge here? because it is compressible. This is the erectile tube that is located on the ventral surface, on the inferior surface of the penis. So again, again, three erectile tubes that you can see here in the penis, two corpora cavernosa and one corpus spongiosum. Again, the corpus spongiosum is where the spongy urethra is gonna be troubled. <coughs> Looking here at the three segments of the penis, this first segment is the root of the penis. Then we have the shaft or the body of the penis. And the last portion of the penis is the glands penis. Glands penis. Looking here, this is the testis. This is going to be the epididymis, the head, body, tail of the epididymis. The continuation of the tail of the epididymis is going to be the ductus deferens or the vas deferens that travels up to meet with the duct coming from the seminal vesicle. Forming together a common duct, we call this is the ejaculatory duct. Right and left ejaculatory ducts, if you see on here, they will release the semen, this glandular secretion from the seminal vesicle along with the sperms into the portion of the urethra traveling inside of the prostate gland. The prostate gland is surrounding the neck of the urinary bladder and the proximal part of the urethra, the prosthetic urethra. The urethra travels to the outside of the prostate gland to enter the root of the penis. If you notice on here, the penis has two, the penis root has two parts. I have this rounded part. This is called the bulb of the penis and I have those wings on both sides those are the crust of penis so the root of the penis is formed of a bulb and the crust bulb crust bulb crust the gland that would be releasing its secretions preceding the ejaculation. Again, this is my bulbourethral gland and from its name, where 
is it going to be joining? It joins the urethra through the bulb of the penis. That's why we call it the bulbo urethral gland. The other name is Cooper's gland. Cooper is the guy who first describes the gland. Again, the bulbo urethral gland secretion is not part of the ejaculated semen. It precedes the ejaculation. It neutralizes the urine acidity in the unit to create a, a suitable environment for the sperms to survive. Again, again, is this gonna be a 10 stars diagram? It's a must be on your test diagram. Every single marking on here is of great importance, highly, highly, highly important. Moving on to the diagrams of the female reproductive system. We have four diagrams which are gonna be related to the female reproductive system. First of them is showing the sagittal section of the female pelvis. showing the reproductive organs and the related pelvic organs. So if you notice, this is the uterus, the vagina. In front of the uterus and the vagina, we've got the urinary bladder and the urethra. And posterior to the uterus and vagina, we've got the rectum which is a straight part of the long intestine. So if we're looking at the reproductive organs, we can see here, this is the ovary. This is the gonad responsible for the production of the mature oocytes, the mature eggs. The ovary is going to be producing mature egg every other month. So I'm alternating the production of the eggs between the two ovaries. So one egg is going to be released from each ovary every two months. Those egg is going to be picked up by those finger-like projections of the fallopian tube. This is called my fimbriae. The fimbriae is, are going to be the finger-like projections from the uterine tube or the fallopian tube that will pick up the ovulated egg. So if we're looking here at the different parts of the fallopian tube, we can see first the finger-like projections of the fallopian tube. Those are my fimbriae. The entrance of the fallopian tube where the egg is going to be traveling. This is called the infundibulum. And this egg, this ovulated egg that got picked up traveling in the infundibulum will travel inside this bulging part of the tube. This enlarged part of the tube is called the ampulla. The ampulla of the fallopian tube is where the fertilization of the egg is going to be taking place. This fertilized egg in the ampulla, if it if it met a sperm, it becomes fertilized, and the fertilized egg is going to be traveling through the fallopian tube, where it gets connected to the uterine cavity by 
the isthmus. The isthmus is this tiny connection between the uterine tube and the endometrium, endometrial cap. If we're looking at the different parts of the uterus, the uterus has a dome-shaped part on here. This is a fundus, fundus. A middle part, this is the body of the uterus. And the part of the uterus that travels to the inside of the vaginal cavity, this is called the cervix. If you get closer here, you will see that the cervix has an opening that is connected to the endometrial cavity, to the cavity of the uterus. So we call this is my internal os. Another opening that is connecting the cervix to the vaginal cavity. This is the external os. And in between there is a tunnel we call this is the cervical canal, cervical canal. So again, again, what are we looking at? We're looking at the different parts of the uterus. We've got the fundus, body of the uterus, cervix. The cervix has internal os, external os, and cervical canal. If we have a cut section in the wall of the uterus, we're gonna see that the wall of the uterus is formed of three layers. From outside, I have this membrane that covers the uterus. We call this is the perimetrium. Peri means around. And metrio, metrio means uterus. So the membrane around the uterus is the perimetrium, perimetrium. Then I have a thick layer of muscles, smooth muscles. This is gonna be my myometrium, myomuscle, metrio uterus. So the myometrium, it is the muscle layer of the uterus. To the inside of the myometrium, you've got the mucus lining of the uterus. We call this is on the inside of the uterus, so we call it endometrium. Endometrium. So again, again, three layers forming the wall of the uterus. This, those are my perimetrium myometrium and endometrium. You're gonna see multiple ligaments that will keep everything in place. We got first the ovarian ligament. You can see it on here, ovarian ligament. The round ligament of the uterus. So you can see them on here as well. This is going to be the round ligament, round ligament. We have a sheet-like ligament that will be covering the uterine tube, the ovary, the uterus. We call this membrane-like ligament. It's the broad ligament, broad ligament. The ligament is surrounding the uterine tube. This is the part of it that surrounds the uterine tube. It's my mesosalpinx. Mesosalpinx. The part of it that covers the ovary. It's my mesovarium. Mesovarium. The part of the broad ligament that covers the uterus. It's my mesometrium, mesometrium. If we're looking here, we're gonna see that a ligament would be attaching the uterus backwards to the sacrum. We'll call this is a uterosacral ligament. Let's see on here this rounded part on here. 
is the uterosacral ligament. We've got two ligaments on both sides that will be holding the cervix in its place in the pelvic cavity. We call those are the lateral ligaments, lateral cervical ligaments or the cardinal ligament. If you notice, we do have space around the cervix in the vagina. We call this is the fornix. So on both sides, those are my lateral fornices. Anteriorly, we're gonna call this space around the cervix. It's the anterior fornix, anterior fornix. Space behind the cervix is the posterior fornix. If we're looking at the external genital organs, we're going to see that the opening of the vagina is covered with a hymen, a mucous membrane. Anterior to the vaginal opening, we're going to see the external urethral opening. And anterior to the external urethral opening, we're going to have the erectile tube that corresponds to the male penis. This is going to be the clitoris. Located posterior to the vaginal opening, we have a gland that will be releasing the mucus secretions that will facilitate the intercourse. This is the Bartholin's gland or the greater vestibular gland. Bartholin's or greater vestibular gland. All those are going to be bounded by two lips. I have a mucous membrane lip. This is going to be the labium minus or labia minora. And I have a skin lip on here. This is called the labium magus or labia majora. So you have labium minus or labium minora and labia majora or magus. It's a uterosacral ligament on here, round ligament, and holding tube in its place down. It's the uterosacral ligament, uterosacral ligament. Questions, questions. Again, again, those two diagrams are of great importance. They must be on your test, must be on your test. Any questions, any questions? So moving on to another less important diagram. It's highly important, but less important than the previous one. So we can see on here, the ovary and the stages of the development of the follicle. We start with a primary follicle that becomes a secondary follicle, gaining multiple layers of follicular cells that will turn into a tertiary follicle and the tertiary follicle here is going to be containing space the tiny little spaces filled with fluids that will fuse together forming the mature follicle or the graphian follicle. The type of oocytes that is kept in all those follicles it's a primary oocyte until the time of ovulation, where the follicle on here get a rupture. And by the time of the ovulation, the egg now will become a secondary oocyte. The remaining follicular cells around the ovulated egg will form a crown 
that is radiating. So we call this is the corona radiata. Corona radiata. The follicular cells will start to atrophy and will form together with the yellow body here. This is the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum. The corpus luteum then remain for 15 days in the ovary, releasing the progesterone that maintains the endometrial lining for the fetus to be implanted. All right. Questions, questions. This is again five stars diagram. Five stars diagram. The description of the graphene follicle is highly important. The space filled with fluid, it's called the antrum. The egg is the oocyte. And the follicular cells that will be directly surrounding the oocyte, this is the zona pellucida, zona pellucida. All this is going to be part of your essay question. Please review this and watch the video recordings multiple times, especially for the part of the essay question, to know exactly what you should be writing as a response to the essay question. Our last diagram related to the reproductive system is going to be the diagram showing the breast. So we're going to see here is the memory glands are arranged into lobules. And those lobules are separated by septi. So you have septum separating two adjacent memory gland lobules. Each of those lobules is going to have a duct. We call this the lactiferous duct. And towards the end of the lactiferous ducts, we have this bulging part. This is where the milk gets stored. This is called the lactiferous sinus. When the baby suckles the nipple, the lactiferous sinuses is going to be stimulated under the effect of the oxytocin. And they will be squeezing the milk to travel from the lactiferous sinuses to the outside through the openings of the lactiferous ducts on the nipple. The nipple here is surrounded by a dark skin, darker colored skin. This is the areola, areola. The breast sits on top of the pectoralis major the mammary glands are surrounded by adipose connective tissue. Adipose connective tissue. This is going to be located below the skin. This is the hypodermis. Questions? Questions? So we've got seven diagrams, seven important diagrams related to the a reproductive system and one big essay question. This big essay question is going to be worth 15 points towards your exam grade. So very important to spend a liquid amount of time to prepare for this essay question. All right. Questions? Any questions? All right, so this completes our discussion for today's session.
thank you so much for making it to the meeting today. So when you watch the video recording, you're going to figure out the essay question. All right. Because this is just a review of the diagrams. So I didn't review the essay question. I didn't mention anything about the essay question in this quick overview. All right, so please watch the video recording, uh, spend enough time to prepare for the essay question and we're gonna discuss it next meeting. All right, but you should have a very strong idea before my before next meeting's review. All right. Thank you so much and we'll see you all next week have a good weekend and please don't forget to sign your first last name in the chatting box in class activity this is a, those are the questions of the in class activities that we've completed today